Cars is the most beautiful racetrack in America, hands down. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to the Breeding Stock Sale. Book one, good to have you back with us. Welcome in, everybody. It is time for the Keeneland Look Ahead. I'm Jeremy Plunk, joining you on a Tuesday evening as we look ahead to race week number three at Keeneland of our four-week spring meet. We've got a five-day racing week, Wednesday through Sunday this week, the only five-day stand of the session. So we get to put together some consistent uh, performances, maybe see how the track plays and kind of roll it out long-term as most we can here at Keeneland in the spring, again, with our only five-day racing week of the season. It all gets underway with Wednesday's card, and we'll get you the particulars on the Wednesday program at the bottom of the screen as post time on Wednesday comes up at 1 o'clock Eastern. Eight-race card, and we've got a nice uh, turf uh, feature for you. Uh, a, a good one on the turf allowance scene in race number seven. We've got some graded stakes performers back. The winner of the Jeff Ruby last year. We've got a grade one winner from a two-year-old season back now at age four. And we've got a horse who looked like a future star at Keeneland when running on the turf here back in the fall meet. Uh, we'll get to see how that one performs on the return to Keeneland as well. So a lot to look forward to in race number seven on the big card on uh, Wednesday. Eight race program overall offering uh, at Keeneland here for the first card of the racing week. Let's give you our mid-season report card and see what we've done so far to this part in the meet. Uh, we are seven race days in in this 15-day stand. We had a three-day opening week, four days last week, taking off Sunday for Easter. Prices have been the story. They're not always easy to get. We've had some fortune and luck here in this space. Hopefully you caught a couple of those prices, but seven winners at 20 to one or more so far this meet. Uh, this is a big number for a spring meet to have seven horses, 20 to one or more win. Uh, we haven't had this in a while like this early in a meet. The eight is a, considered a big number for an entire meet. We get just one more price during the meet, and we're looking into kind of record territory on the dirt in the spring meet of getting eight or more 20 to 1 winners. So, uh, prices and shopping for prices has been good business so far uh, during this Keeneland meet. And the horses coming off of layoffs, as you see, 16 of the 68 winners so far so the, this season were making their first starts of 2022. They were coming off the layoff at least four months plus back into 2021. 16 out of 68 is almost one out of four. 16 out of 64 would be one out of four. So a quarter of the winners almost this race meet are making their first starts of the year. So don't be afraid of the layoffs. These horses are training up the races. They're pointing for Keeneland and they're winning at Keeneland. Uh, I would not be afraid of that as we continue into the meet either. Uh, Gulfstreams had 18 winners who last out race down in South Florida, 14 from Fairgrounds. As the meet continues in the week three and the week four, I think you're going to see the Fairgrounds horses uh, continue. They had a good rise last week in week number two. I would think the Fairgrounds horses are going to continue that ascent. The Gulfstream horses are performing well. And they're doing better on the turf. You know, if you if you saw the first uh, one or two episodes here of the Keeneland Look Ahead, I was suggesting that the Gulfstream turf horses might have a little bit of drop-off this year. That hasn't necessarily been the case, but a lot of the horses we have seen winning on the turf have been laying off since last year. So they're not going to be Gulfstream performers running January, February, March, April during their championship meet in South Florida. But the Gulfstream horses have fared uh, well, you saw with the 18 winners so far. Um, on the season. Uh, this week, in terms of stakes races, we've got a trio of them for you. Malathot, last year's Kentucky Oaks winner, she's back on Friday in the Double Dog Dare Stakes. Uh, she takes on Bonnie South, the defending champ in the race. A really nice field for that one on Friday. And then on Saturday, entries will be drawn on Wednesday tomorrow uh, for the Elkhorn, for the mile and a halfers on the turf, the males there, and the Ben Ally, which is the handicap division big race of the season for the older 
uh, Colton Gellings on the main track. The grade three Ben Ally uh, will be co-featured on the Saturday program. If you like to play handicapping contests, I want to remind you, this might be a little rich for some of the followers out there, but others who are serious horse players and who follow the podcast, the grade one gamble, which is Keeneland's annual big high roller uh, handicapping contest, is this Saturday. You can play on track at Keeneland. You can also play at some ADWs around the country with uh, satellite wagering as well and take part in it. It's a $3,500 entry to play. A lot of that is invested back into your bankroll. It's a live money bankroll contest. I think it's 1000 in the entry fee and $2,500 in the live bankroll. So $3,500 to play. But if you're into the contest scene, this is one you definitely want to take a look at. Uh, big money and prizes on the line plus uh, qualifiers to all the big handicapping tournaments at the end of the year, all expense paid trips, NHC, Breeders' Cup betting challenge, those kind of uh, competitions. So the Great One Gamble is this Saturday. Check it out at Keeneland.com if you want more information or your favorite ADW where you play the races. Uh, check and see if they're offering uh, online satellite uh, uh, registration for the Great One Gamble to play online this weekend. So that's a look ahead and a look behind as we get set for week number three. Time now to take a look at the big picture, which is our uh, nightly look at the next day's card and how we see it in terms of the races lining up and, and where the big plays might come from. In terms of an eight race card, where do the pick fours and pick fives start and overlap? The big picture for Saturday or for Wednesday for our first race day of the week, you're going to see the pick five begins in race number one, the pick four in race two, the pick six in race three. Now we get to race number four and the late pick five is kicking up its heels. So race four is going to overlap not only the early pick five, but the late pick five. And when you get to race number five, the late pick four starts. Of course, that would be part of the late pick five, which begins a race earlier. And it starts the late pick four. So races four and five, as our key plays show up, you really have to focus on these races in your handicapping. You want to get a good feel for races four and five. If you're a multi-race player, a strong opinion in either one of those races can set you up in both sequences, early and late. Again, the pick fives, races four and five are involved in all the pick fives. Races four, race four is part of all the pick, or race five is part of all the pick fours. And of course, race number four is part of the early pick fours. So a lot riding on those two races. Uh, we happen to have our longest price of the day in race number five. This gets the excitement meter up. You know, this is kind of what we're looking for uh, as, as we set up and we look at a big picture. Why do you do this? Because you want to see, A, where your opinions are, right? You handicap the card ahead. You're watching this tonight. It's uh, 8.30 Eastern. Uh, as you handicap the next day's card, you, you're strategizing. You pick the horses you think have the best chance to win. You cross-check them against the morning line odds, and you see, wow, well, maybe I'm going to get a price here or there, or maybe I'm on favorites in these particular races. How do we, my main place tomorrow plot out? Then you look at something like the big picture, and you say, wow. My key play, 15 to 1, my best price of the day, is in a swing race that takes me through everything, you know? I mean, race 5 is all the candy. It's part of the early pick 4. It starts the late pick 4. It's the second leg of the late pick 5, and it's the anchor leg of the early pick 5. So... In terms of excitement, this is what I want. My biggest price play of the day in the race that can be utilized and leveraged the most. So am I excited about the Wednesday card? Absolutely. We told you on Sunday that, you know, this is one of those cards that look like it kind of chalk out in some spots and maybe you can catch a winner here or there. We caught the big price winner, right? We had the $40 plus horse here uh, on the Keeneland look ahead. So you only need one. And if the prices are kind of short around it, you got to make your hay on, on the big one. And uh, we've had some pretty nice winners throughout the course of the meet. We just missed on Saturday with a 20 to one that came up about a neck short rallying. So uh, we've been knocking on the door. We've had a good run so far. Uh, ROI is up over $3. I think it was three twenty dollars something uh, after the first couple of days. I've got it here, the recap. We keep track of what we do. This is the selector's box every day and kind of keep track of who's doing what and, and the totals at the bottom. We want to kind of, you know, have some accountability in what we're doing. And uh, through two weeks of the meet, we're 21 for 68. That's 32% with the top picks. And $216 returned if you bet $2 to win on all 68 picks. So you needed $136 to be even. You got two sixteen back. That means your ROI has been three dollars and twenty six cents playing the top pick so far this meet. That's crazy. It's not going to last that. <laughs> you know, if we can get to the end of the meet and be at two dollars even, that's a fantastic meet breaking even. But halfway through the meet to have an ROI of three twenty six for every two dollars bet, 
Uh, very happy with that and proud of that. But I also know by mentioning it, I probably just jinxed it. And then we go in the tank now all of a sudden uh, because the racing gods do not like when you tell them you think you've got things figured out. Uh, we never have it figured out, but sometimes you go through hot streaks and sometimes you go through cold ones. I will tell you this, last fall meet was as bad as I've ever handicapped at Keelan. It was absolutely atrocious. I went one streak where I believe the losing streak was 28 consecutive races. It spanned over three cards. Uh, I was telling my wife, I think I'm done handicapping. I can't do it anymore. I don't know why I've lost my touch. Uh, you can get in slumps, uh, but now it's going well. So, you know, fight through it, uh, know that it happens to everybody. And I didn't put any less work into it last fall than I am now, but sometimes the dots don't connect and sometimes they do. We're on a good roll right now. Let's see if that can't uh, continue. Other key play on the card on uh, Wednesday, we got a nice eight to one shot who I really, really like. This is a horse I love. Uh, I'll tell you right now, Gray's Creek in the seventh race, uh, going to be when I key play late in the day, uh, that being in the turf allowance feature. So let's get handicapping. We're going to go through each of the eight races as we do here on the podcast. And, uh, we'll refer back to the big picture to try to, you know, show you where sequences come and go. And we'll also refer quite a bit here to the, uh, Keeneland selections box. Uh, uh the Keeneland selections box is the public handicappers at Keeneland.com. You can go print this out, download it yourself, refer back to it. Scott Hazelton from the TV broadcast, Tom Leach, of course, with a lot of the trainer interviews and, and the preview stuff, the voice of the Kentucky Wildcats. He's having an excellent neat handicapping, uh, myself, Gabby Gaudette, Kim Nelson, uh, everybody doing a really nice job throughout the course of the selectors box I, I bring this up each time so that we can kind of see where the commonality reigns you know where the handicappers are all kind of on the same horses that will lead you to where you think favorites are going to be on the card uh and then also take a look at where there are races where there is such a, a diverse um opinion of the races that you think this could be the wide open kind of events so as you glance through this eight race selectors box and, I, and i'll refer to it back and forth throughout the course uh of the podcast but you know as you go through there you're looking for uh situations where the same horse is picked over and over on top like where does the single on this particular card comes from american smooth is picked by three of the five in race number one as you look across the uh grids um, he's in charge is picked by three of five in race number three. That could be a, a runner that uh, a lot of folks are leaning upon, but there's not just a whole lot of situations. Beep beep in race number six is picked by three of the five and Lapis Lazuli in, in race eight picked by three of the five. So with five public handicappers in an eight race card, there's not a single race where four out of five agree. That tells you there's not going to be a lot of like, two to five type favorites on this card, right? I mean, we don't all have to agree. And a lot of times we're trying to beat the same horse sometimes. Uh, but when three out of five is like the most commonality you see on a card, chances are it's going to be a pretty wide open program. And so uh, I think we could look at some juicy type prices here. You know, are we going to get more 20 to one winners? We've already had seven at the, at the meet. I don't know. I mean, if, and if we do, I hope we have the one that is, uh, but you can't expect 20 to one winners, but uh, I don't expect this to be kind of a parade of, you know, four and $5 horses on, on uh, Wednesday. So let's get right to the handicapping race. Number one, as we start things off, this is a mile and a 16th claiming race, non winners of two lifetime. Uh, this is a race uh, format that the Durfway park horses have really dominated. We've had four non winners of two lifetime races at the meet so far. Horses from Turfway account for three of those wins. And if you go back to the spring meet of 2019, the last 21 times we've had a non-winners of two lifetime race at Keeneland, 10 of the winners have been horses from Turfway Park. So I think you want to lean towards the Turfway horses in here if you can find ones that you like. But in this race, you know, painting, uh, perfect painting, the one, El Paquin, the three, neither one of them looks like a whole lot on paper. So for me, I think you want to go a different angle. The five American smooth is the horse I ended up with. Trainer Eddie Keneally's coming off a good week. Eddie Keneally won three races last week. He had two second place finishes. So that's five in the exacta from just 10 starters for Eddie Keneally. Uh, going back through the database, that was the first time in, I believe, about three, four years where Eddie had a three-win week. Uh, at Keeneland. So his horses are on point. They're running well. So I'm going with Eddie Keneally and number five, American Smooth in the opener. Uh, Luis Saez kind of got back on the beam and had a nice racing week last week uh, after a little bit of a slow start by his standards for sure, uh, opening weekend of the meet. I'll take the five, American Smooth, 
Uh, and you look across, uh, Scott's also on American Smooth, Tom's on American Smooth, and the horse is picked second by Gabby and Kim. This is probably a favorite who's going to start off on the program here. Uh, if you're going to go against the favorite in, you know, in this spot, then they all kind of look about the same. I think we're kind of on the Eddie Keneally's hot angle probably, and you get a little bit of a class drop. This horse has not been in for a claiming tag this low yet in its career. It's never been offered for less than 30, and that maiden company won a victor. So let's go with American Smooth in the opener, but not a race where, uh, you know, I'm getting wild and, you know, I've got some horses I like in other races in the sequence as we take a look at the big picture. The pick five will start here. Um if if you just settle on the favorite, then your pick five is not going to cost any more than the pick four because you're multiplying by one. Uh, you know, the difference in cost between the pick four and the pick five ticket. If you start with that single in the opener, the difference in the cost is absolutely nothing. So uh, if you can, uh, you know, come up with the rest of the sequence and you want to play it back, uh, go ahead and take a shot at the pick five if you think you've got the favorite in the opener. I'm not wild about the pick, and it looks like the horse may end up the favorite being the top pick or second choice uh, by all the public handicappers. So, you know, let's see how the rest of the sequence plays out and whether or not we want to go pick four or pick five. Race number two up next, and this is a horse I do like in here. Uh, this is a non-maiden uh, claimer down towards the basement level here for a $20,000 maiden claiming tag. They're just sprinting six furlongs. Six furlong races at Keeneland generally go to speed to begin with. And when you get down to the cheaper class levels, they really favor speed. So the average winner in these maiden claiming races, 30 of them we had in the spring, um, going back to the beginning of dirt 2015 in the spring meet, uh, the average winner is only three quarters of a length off the lead after the opening half mile. So you want a horse who's forwardly placed. You don't want big closers in here. And horses who have some experience have had the edge for sure at this class level in the maiden claiming races, 30 of them that we told you about, 24 of the winners were horses who had raced before, six of them first-time starters. So that's 80% went to horses with experience. That's enough for me to lean uh, towards the experience. If you like a first-time starter, you should really like the first-time starter, and it should be a horse that you're getting a good price on because you are going uh, against the trend in, in that respect. I like the one in here, Joyful Candy, comes in from Fairgrounds. The Fairgrounds horses have accounted for nine of these 30 wins in the maiden claiming sprint races. Uh, over the years at Keeneland, a slight edge. Well, uh, Fairgrounds has the nine. Turfway Park only has four winners, so a decent gap there. And about a third of the winners coming from uh, Turfway Park, nine out of 30, so are, are coming from Fairgrounds, I should say, nine out of 30. Fairgrounds horses have done good at the meet, as, as you saw. Only Gulfstream has produced more winners of uh, this season. So I went with the one, Joyful Candy. That was my top pick here in the second race. It's going to kick off the pick four. And Joyful Candy, I'm on an island with. I like that. Nobody else has Joyful Candy on top. In fact, when I say I'm on an island and I like it, that's like nobody else is picking the same horse I am. I feel good about that. I think I'll get a better price that way. Um, I've seen something maybe the others haven't. I feel good, you know, in that situation. Well, I'm on an island five times in the eight races on Wednesday's card. That doesn't happen very often. So, you know, maybe I'm feeling my oats because I'm off to a good start with the handicapping and the numbers that I read. And, and I'm seeing the ball well, as we say in baseball terms. But Maybe get a little cocky too. You know, you, you just don't keep reeling in price after price after price and that sort of thing like that. So uh, let's see how it plays out. You know, being on an island a few times a day is a good feeling. Being on an island five times in eight races, it's a little scary in, in, in sense of, you know, like how did I look at this card? Did I look at it too brashly or am, am I that dialed in? We'll know soon enough. Let's see how uh, Island Candy does in race number two. Uh, this is going to be uh, a four-year-old taking on three-year-olds in this particular spot. Uh, uh, there is a, a quite a bit of a weight allowance at this time of year. We're starting to see the three-year-olds and up at Keeneland. Uh, so seven-pound shift over six furlongs. That doesn't bother me too much. I'll take the one joyful candy. Uh, Prince of Glory is the other I like in here. This is a three-year-old taking on the Elders. Uh, Prince of Glory comes off the layoff from last September, but by Cairo Prince gets blinkers and Lasix, so a lot going on. Cairo Prince, a good sire at Keeneland. Uh, one and eight of the two I really like in here. Wesley Ward's got the first-time starter uh, in here in race number two, Go Virtual. Uh, Go Virtual gets Joel Rosario to ride. It is a three-year-old taking on older horses. And again, we haven't seen the first-time starters in these elder races do much at the meet. In fact, they've been shut out. Of all the first-time starters that have won this meet in the maiden races, the two-year-olds, obviously, because 
99 out of 100 horses are going to be first-time starters in these two-year-old baby races. But in the elder maiden races, we haven't seen a single first-time starter click at the meet yet. Uh, Wesley Ward will get Joel Rosario to ride go virtual. It's a three-year-old against elder horses. The firsters aren't clicking. May not make a connection to this race. Sometimes, like I say, the stats have to make sense to you. I don't have a real good reason why the older maiden special weight horses are and maiden claiming horses haven't produced a single winner yet at the meet. That seems to be an anomaly that will change uh, as we go. It could start right here with Go Virtual in race number two, but I wouldn't take a short price to find out. That's the whole thing about stats and trends and things like that. You know, people say, oh, your rules, your rules are, are broken, you know, Apollo curse and all this other stuff. There are no rules. There are no rules to handicapping. But if you are looking at generalities and trends and things don't happen very often or they do happen very often, the thing that it should impact is not your thought of can it possibly happen. It should impact what price I will take on this to happen. You know, if something is 80% not likely to happen, uh, it's a negative stat, that kind of deal like that, you may not toss the horse out. But if he looks five or she looks five to one to you on paper and that stat's telling you maybe not, maybe you want to back off. Well, if you're going to get like 10 to one versus five to one, then you're still worth the gamble. But if you think this horse is worth about five to one, and he's clicking around four to one as they get close to post time, and the negative numbers are telling you otherwise, then that's where the stats and trends help push you away. So always be price sensitive with that. Let's go to the third race on the card and take a look at uh, what the public handicappers have here. It's he's in charge for three different handicappers on top in race number three. Uh, I've got King's Mischief in here, and uh, again, I'm on an island with King's Mischief. Uh, I love the In the Mischief uh, offspring here. Uh, the sire has, cre uh, has produced, not produced, but the sire has been responsible for, or represented by, uh, more winners on the Keeneland Dirt than anybody else, and they have a particularly strong record at seven furlongs. So anytime you see an In the Mischief horse running seven furlongs at Keeneland, I'm already kind of like dialed in, you know, I'm thinking about this, and, and that's the kind of horse I want. But you can't make a pedigree play on a horse who's run three times over the track already and hasn't hit the board in three tries. So you got to like more about King's Mischief than just the, the sire and the pedigree. But we'll say this. This is the class drop. First time in for a claiming tag. In the previous races at Keeneland, including a mile race here during the fall meet, uh, this horse was beaten four lengths by Ducale in Allowance Company. Uh, Ducale's a very nice horse uh, on the borderline of a stakes kind of three-year-old uh, uh, an older horse now. So uh, I think that uh, you know King's Mischief is a horse who Maybe have an 0 for 3 record here at Keeneland, but if you'd have been running against this level of competition, the, the non-winners and two claimers uh, with the pedigree and the, and the performance the horse had in allowance company, then you could possibly say this horse would not be 0 for 3 and, and would have a better record over the course. But the other thing about, I like about King's Mischief, it looks like the horse can sit third. I'm a big pace handicapper. I think the 3 Roderick and the 4 he's in charge are both horses who are making big class drops and are just speed. I think that you're looking at speed with the three Roderick and the four he's in charge. I, I kind of look at those two as going out and knocking each other early. And the horse who sits third could get the dream trip. That's what I'm hoping to get with King's Mischief. On the outside, that's a good spot to be going seven furlongs down the back stretch. So let's hope the three and four Roderick and he's in charge clear off, go fast. King's Mischief just kind of sit out there in the clear, uh, down the back stretch into the far turn, sits third, and uh, in turning back in distance is able to pounce on him. So that's why I'm on the seven in here, King's Mischief. But I will say this, when you've got two speed horses, you're always a little bit dangerous in thinking they're going to knock each other out because if one doesn't break, the other's loose. If you have a scratch of either Roderick or he's in charge, then obviously the pace scenario uh, does make a, a drastic change. So if the three or four were to scratch in this race, you would definitely look at the other one left and think that they have a major chance in here because then their potential loan speed. So watch the scratches and changes, particularly in race number three. And in any race you handicap, when there are just two speed horses in a race, you really want to check the scratches and changes because this might be a situation that, you know, when the field's final and they're heading to the starting eight, there's only one lone speed horse left. Um, and then they're in the ultimate advantage in handicapping. So uh, Roderick, he's in charge. Those are the speed. I'll take King's Mischief from a little bit off the pace. Uh, and that's the way I see it in race number three. Fourth race on the card on Wednesday. We get halfway home on an eight race program with the two-year-olds and interesting placement on the card. We usually don't see the two-year-old races this deep into the sequence, uh, usually race one, race two. Uh, but this is buried in race number four, which means when you play the 
early pick five that begins, you know, as we take a look at the big picture, as you play the early pick five that begins in race number one, you're not going to see the wagering or the horses in the paddock or on the track, the warm-ups. Uh, you won't get much sense for this race whatsoever other than what you handicap ahead uh, for race number four. So it's not going to help you a lot in the early pick five. And the same in the early pick four, which begins in race number two. Now, the pick five that begins in race number four, as we call that the swing, because it's involved in both uh, uh, early and late pick fives, because of the placement of this race, race number four, the two-year-olds, in race number four, you will get to see the horses before the race, the tote action that's going on. Hear from the commentators, any interviews with connections before the race, that sort of thing. So if you're playing pick fives on this Wednesday card, the early pick five, starting in race number one, you are blind to what's happening in race number four. You're just going to have to trust your paper handicapping, your pedigree study, that sort of thing like that, workout reports, uh, clocker reports, whatever information you can gather. If you want to play the pick five that goes races four through eight, the late pick five, you're going to have all the knowledge. So unless you have a good sense in the early pick five of what's going to happen here in race number four, I think you want to make a stronger bet on this Wednesday card on the late pick five versus the early pick five. If you had to choose between those two, I think you want to spend more money on the late pick five than the early pick five because you're going to see what's you know cooking uh, in race number four. As far as the public handicappers go across the way uh, in the fourth race, uh, we're a, you know for a two-year-old race, this is about as all over the board as you're ever going to see in race number four. Uh, you've got Magic Tap for Steve Asmussen, picked by Scott. Uh, you've got Abenati, the Luis Mendez charge down on the rail. Uh, we'll wear a saddle towel three uh, for Tom. I went with the six, talking Farrell, sticking by Wesley Ward one more time. Uh, late September is uh, a Rusty Arnold for uh, uh, the nine hole, and uh, Gabby Gaudet's going to take that one on top. And Kim Nelson's even looking to the uh, 13 in Taster for the King, the other Wesley Ward, perhaps, in this particular race, uh, drawn to the far outside. So this is what happens after a little while. We've seen four, four two-year-old races so far at the meet. Wesley Ward only has one win. We expect right now for him to have two or three, if not all four of them, from what we've seen in past years. And people are starting to get a little gun-shy, right? I mean, this is a perfect example of it. I don't think I've ever seen a Keeneland two-year-old race in the spring where the five public handicappers have five different horses. Wesley's never run five in the same race, the John Hancock. I mean, look, we, we kind of lean towards a lot of the same things here and what we can find, you know, some pedigree, some trainers and things like that. But these are Wesley country. And now that he's won for four at the meet, I think people are getting a little bit tense and scared. Uh, will that help on the tote board to get a little bit bigger price if you stick with them? Uh, maybe so. When he snapped out of his slump in uh, the 2019 spring meet, uh, yeah, the last time we had the traditional spring meet, or 2021 last year, uh, his first winner back was, a, you know, 20 cents on the dollar horse. He had a short price winner with his first winner uh, last week as well. So I don't think people are going to completely abandon ship, but it's certainly not going to hurt your price. Uh, I went with... Uh, Wesley's uh, six horse in here talking Farrell. This is a $250,000 American Farrell. Uh, Irad Ortiz takes the call. You know, the connections obviously have been very strong at the meet, especially in the turf sprints. Uh, but this horse has a Keeneland workout. When we pick against Wesley, it's when his horses don't have the Keeneland workout when they come up from Florida, when they have the turfway workouts, much smaller percentage winning. Uh, I think talking Farrell with the local work, the, the good pedigree, uh, should be win early out of a midshipman mare. So I'm going to go with the six, Talking Farrell, who actually draws the four hole in here uh, the way it goes. And if there's not much speed to the inside, uh, you know with these Wesley horses, when they break, they're going to run. When they don't break, they're not going to. So you're going to know right away with Talking Farrell. The outside horse taster for the king, a uh, little bit less uh, impressive pedigree. The include on the damn side of the pedigree kind of makes me think, you know, not as quick and brilliant early and more of a distance horse. Um, but certainly uh, Wesley gets him out of the gate and gets him ready to go. So if he's running one out of an include mare going four and a half to debut, he, you know, he's got some info that the horse can be quick enough. Uh, Gerardo Corrales rides the 13 taster for the king. Gerardo Corrales coming off a huge week with three long shot winners last week, and he just had a fantastic run. Uh, he's riding very well against the big boys. So uh, Corrales on the 13, no argument there. Other ones in here, uh, you've got some shots. Uh, the seven, Baytown, get it on. Uh, this is a horse who was second earlier in the meet in the first two-year-old race of the year to kid Ad Rock uh, in the first race of the year. 
Now, debut runners who come back in the second time running here in the spring meet uh, at Keeneland. So they debut here at Keeneland. They run back second time at the meet, run backs as I call them. They're only three for 69 since we went back to tur uh, dirt. So uh, these horses don't win second time running back at the meet very often. So Baytown get it on might look good on paper after chasing Kid Adrock in the debut. But the numbers say probably not. Only three of those since 2015 have come back to win. Uh, Kid Adrock, who did win that race back on opening day, was trained by Luis Mendez. Luis Mendez has Abenati in here uh, from a rail draw. When you get out of the gate and roll there, uh, that can be a good spot. So Abenati is my second pick. I used the three underneath, and that is the top pick uh, by Tom Leach as well. So uh, a little bit of love in there for Abenati for Luis Mendez, who already has a, a win at the meet. Magic Tap, well-bred, $450,000 tap it out of American Story. Uh, Steve Asmussen had a second-place finisher. Uh, in a two-year-old race uh, last week. Uh, he hasn't won a two-year-old race at Keeneland. I believe 2017 or 2015, he won two of them. It's been about five years for Steve uh, to win a two-year-old race here, but he doesn't run that many. Magic Tap certainly uh, would not be a major surprise. But race number four, as we go to the big picture, this starts off the late pick five, and it's a swing race. We, you know, let's see what happens ahead of time. I mean, I definitely, you know, ahead of the race, like, you know, who's really live on the tote perhaps is, is a, a consideration for some. Less for me. I'm not a big tote board watcher in terms uh, of the races. I kind of trust my eyes and, and want uh, bigger prices than just horses who are live and being bet. Uh, I think you might want to get a little coverage in here. This is not your traditional, uh, you know, pick four uh, single race that you would. Um, in a normal Keeneland uh, two-year-old season. You know, I, I, I think Talking Pharaoh is the top horse in here and the one to watch, but I would not single and put a whole ticket around that horse. So I would use Talking Pharaoh the six. I would use Abenati the three, um, you know, and, in you know, some other considerations, uh, Magic Tap for Asmussen certainly could, you, you could talk me into. And the four Simply Super is, is training really well uh, by Super Saver, a, a, a sire who's done okay here uh, in the past with, with older horses for sure, has good numbers, and also won a two-year-old race back here in 2018 in the Baby Dashes. So Simply Super with uh, Tyler Gaffleone. I've already given you four, six, three, eight, four. I didn't even use the other Wesley in here. So uh, there, there's some places to go late September, the nines, not without uh, some possibility. I think uh, race four looks to be difficult now when you start to say pick five, you're going to have to go pretty deep in there. So uh, pick five starting in race number four, you're going to want to use a lot of ducks. I think uh, uh, the bottom line, the other way to go is just to pick one and single single or spread, right? I mean, if you go, if you single a horse, it's, you multiply your ticket times one when you get to that race. If you've got five in there, you're multiplying the cost of your ticket by five. So if you have 40 combinations in all the other races, now you're up to 200 when you go five deep versus just a $40 ticket if you single. So in the decision of single or spread, the best decision usually is to single. Um, I don't like big spread tickets, but if you're somebody who plays big spread tickets, uh, you'll debate me on that and tell me about the time you hit for, you know, 17,000 because you used the fifth best horse on your ticket. I, I get that. And I, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's anecdotal, but it's money and it all spends and it all counts. So, uh, but for me, I, I would rather peel my ticket back. So I'm going to have to have opinions in other races to get involved in this pick five because I can't narrow race number four down enough uh, to do the damage. Uh, race number five, as we talk, as we roll on on this card on Saturday, this is a starter allowance on the turf going a mile. And this is one of our key plays of the day. We've got uh, 15 to one morning line shot in here. And we're going to see if we can't uh, pull a little magic with a horse named Hat Tip. Hat Tip is our top pick in race number five. And as you see the public handicappers, uh, Keelan, there's only one seven on the board. Nobody else even has Hat Tip in the top three. But I like this one. One of the reasons I like Hat Tip in here is because of the conditions of the race. This is a starter allowance for horses who have run for 50000 or less or have not won a race like a one other than type situation. This is a four-time winner against mostly horses with one career victory. Some have two. But for the most part, these horses are eligible for like a first level 1X type race. Hat Tip has won four times, ran second here for this $50,000 starter condition, going a mile last April. So this is a horse who obviously fits. Now he comes in fresh, has the four career victories. Uh, Mitchell Murrell gets you some prices. He rarely gets bet. Uh, you know, this horse is coming off the layoff since last July at Ellis Park. But a horse who has run well for the condition, over the turf, fresh, 
We talked about it uh, with, with the stat, what, 25% of the winners so far this meet almost have been horses who haven't raced yet this year. So you get a fresh horse coming off the layoff, uh, has run at this condition, is a four-time winner against a lot of one- and two-time winners. And the other thing I like about this, and I mentioned it in the big picture, is I've got a 15-to-1 morning line price in a race with a long shot profile. And what do I mean by long shot profile? This is one of the things where I go back and use the database at Keeneland.com a lot is I'm trying to see like what wins these kind of races. And in these starter allowance races on the turf in the spring, we've only had eight of them coming to this point. Only one favorite has won. And we've had upsets at 14 to 1 and 55 to 1. So more horses have paid $30 or more than favorites in these eight races. It's a small sample size, but it tells you that the public doesn't have a great feel for it. And it can also tell you that, like, the horsemen don't have a great feel for who should be running in these either. Again, this is a race where, like, from, like, a starter allowance situation, you could be a four-time winner, like, hat tip and run in this race. And a lot of trainers are using it like an A other than or a 1X uh, with a horse who has one career victory. So... I'll take the four-time winner, the six-year-old mare, durable, coming back, and, and has run well in this race before. But it's a long shot profile, right? Favorites haven't done well in the limited starts. Long shots have won a, a decent amount of them. And the other thing is, is big closers have done well in this race. The average winner of these uh, starter allowance races on the turf has been more than four lengths off the lead after the opening half. Uh, give me a horse from off the pace. Hat tip likes that kind of style. And we'll take our chances. If we pull it off, then we're on an island and we've got a big one. Uh, we were able to do that once or twice already this meet with some horses that were in the $40 and up range. And I think we can get a nice price in race number five on a hat tip. I'm long-winded today. We're like 35 minutes in and I'm only on race number six. So if I've ruined your snack or your primetime series for tonight, uh, I apologize. We'll pick up the pace here uh, over the final uh, three races on the card. We start next up in race number six. And this is another uh, non-winners of two lifetime race where, you know, it was similar to what we saw in race number one on the card with the non-winners of two. We talked about the Turfway horses who had good success. They've won three of the four so far this meet. Ten of 21 non-winners of two claimers going back to uh, 2019 in the spring meet have gone to Turfway Park shippers. So the Turfway horses are certainly ones you want to take a look at here. And I went to Captain Fantastic. He's the Turfway horse. I'm going to lean my hat on. But I obviously know Beep Beep, if you look, Beep Beep is picked on top uh, by Scott Hazelton, picked on top by Gabby Gaudet, picked on top uh, by Kim Nelson. Beep Beep, trained by Norm Cassie, also known as Gabby Gaudet's husband. And, and Gabby doesn't always pick Norm's horses. And maybe that's a little contentious around the dinner table at night. I don't know how they feel about that, but she doesn't pick his horses all the time. So the fact that she's actually picking beep beep uh, is, is a good sign. Um, you know, she doesn't go out of her way to pick Norm's horses. Uh, so they must feel that they're in a good spot here. This is a horse who did run in the Risen Star Stakes and now is in a non-winners of two. Problem was that Risen Star Stake was over a year ago and Beep Beep has only run once since. Uh, but definitely a class edge for this four-year-old Colt by Tapazar. I think Beep Beep's the horse to beat, uh, dropping in class. Norm does a good job on these class droppers. Uh, drawn well if they get out of the gate. Problem is with this one, they're adding blinkers, but it hasn't been a very good gate breaker in, in, in many starts. So Beep Beep's going to have to hustle out of there. You get a front-running jockey in Joe Talamo. I think you'll know the fate for Beep Beep in the seven furlong race after about a quarter of a mile. If he's up and into the race, um, he's going to be a factor in here to the end. If he's not, then it might not work out uh, in his favor. I, I just took the turfway angle. I like the turfway horses, the success they've had at this class level. And Captain Fantastic is a horse by Midnight Loot. I love the midnight loots here at Keeneland on the main track, especially going long. They have a tremendous record around two turns, around seven furlongs. You know, the, the stats are still good, but not like they are around two turns. But I think Captain Fantastic is a horse who's going to run well here. Has run twice long here at Keeneland, uh, back in Maiden Claiming Company last year with a different barn. Been claimed around a couple times, but uh, this is one from just off the pace. I don't think he's going to be terribly far back with Luis Saez. Saez tends to get horses in the race. I'm going to take my shot with Captain Fantastic in here. Coming off the turfway, uh, a third place finish has been in the money and in the super in what about seven, eight, uh, eight, ten races in a row has been in the super. You know, you're going to get a good effort out of Captain Fantastic. Uh, nothing against the former riders who are on this one, but if Sias can get the extra couple of lengths out of this horse that the other ones didn't, and he's constantly knocking in the super, 
then you got a shot maybe to get over the top at a little bit of a price. So I went with Captain Fantastic in there. Beep beep, definitely the other horse you have to to give major consideration to, and the and the other class drop or drop anchor. I think if you get through seven, two, and three, that you'll have very very good coverage in in race number six. Uh, maybe seven and two just far deep enough, but I wouldn't go any deeper uh, than three deep there uh, in the six. To the seventh we go, and it's our last key play on the card. Eight to one morning line horse. We're on the turf here in race number seven. It's a non-winner or a three other than allowance race. So you've got borderline stakes company, and you've got stakes caliber horses uh, in the seventh race. It's a very good one. Eight to one in the morning line with my top choice, and I think we'll get a decent price on Gray's Creek. Gray's Creek was absolutely sensational here, uh, just like shot out of a rocket back in July of 20. Uh, uh, 2020. That was that pandemic meet we had here. Uh, just made a phenomenal run getting over the top of the grass uh, when trained by Chad Brown. I thought we had a future stake star on our hands. Didn't quite develop into that. This is a six-year-old horse now making his first start since last June. He's been turned over to Paulo Lobo, a very good turf trainer, of course. We know Paulo Lobo can get one uh, ready to go, and especially uh, one coming off a break like this. The Lobo's horses really strike, what, uh, six for 19 coming off layoffs in six months or more, according to DRF. I think he's going to have Gray's Creek, who has a bullet workout for this, uh, in fine fellow. The horse really likes the track. Ran a big race here last April. Moved too soon that day and was caught as the 8-5 to five favorite late, but uh, this is a horse, Gray's Creek, the seven in race seven, who I'm going to hang my hat on for the day. I think it's a horse for course. I think it's a horse who's going to run really well off the layoff of Paulo Lobo. You get Luis Saez. Saez could have a pretty big day if I've got anything to say with it. And it's a race where there's other options where I think you're going to hold your price. You got grade one winner in here, get her number, trying uh, to go long on the turf for the first time at Keeneland, a West Coaster coming in. You got Like the King who won the Jeff Ruby uh, last year, uh, Mark Cassie, uh, now the trainer, formerly Wesley Ward. Glenn County is a course winner here at Keeneland. A very good field. Beacon Hills run well over the course uh, for Mike Matz last year. I believe that's the first Mike Max horse we've had come in uh, for the spring meet as well. Joel Rosario will ride. So excellent connections. There are a lot of good options. Wesley Ward's got Invader. I didn't even mention and an Invader's done absolutely nothing wrong in his career. He's there banging every time. Uh, Ward having such a good meet, especially on the grass. So it's a competitive race. And this is one of those where you say, wow, there are so many different options. This is the classic single or spread to me, you know. Um, and if I'm spreading, a lot of the other ones start to look a lot alike. You know, I can make a case. I didn't even mention TD Vance, who had no pace help at all down at Fairgrounds. You got Brad Cox and Irad Ortiz, and that's like the sixth horse I'm mentioning in the seventh race. So you get my point here. If it's not Gray's Creek, if I'm wrong about Gray's Creek, if I don't get that part of it right, then it could be any of them. Then you're really spreading your ticket. I think I've got the right horse. I'm confident in the way the handicapping is going for the meet. It's my key play number three here of the day. And really of the individual plays, this is the key. I will be singling in all the multi-race wagers late in the day, number seven, Gray's Creek, and eight to one in the morning line. I'm a win bet down to about five to one. I think this horse offers value down around five to one. Um, so if I can get the eight, I'm extremely happy to bet intra-race. If I get down to five, I'm still acceptable of that. But in terms of a multi-race bet, if the horse is 8-1 to in the morning line and there's other really good options for good barns and you're singling on your ticket, you get yourself separated from the public quite a bit in the pick four and pick five. So that's the way I'm going to do it. Gray's Creek, if uh, Gray's Creek runs his race on uh, Wednesday, we're going to have a good second half of the card. Now we're going to wrap up with a favorite here. Like I said, I was on an island five of eight races on uh, on Wednesday, where I'm the only one picking in the selectors box, the horse on top. Lapis Lazuli, as you see, though, Scott, Tom, myself, third pick for Gabby, uh, not used by Kim Nelson, but Lapis Lazuli is a horse uh, that a lot of folks, I think, are going to be on here. See, we mentioned Gabby doesn't pick her, her husband's horse all the time. She's not on Lapis Lazuli here on the class drop. Norm Cassie, the trainer. But I think this one's got the fairgrounds profile, uh, maiden claiming races. Uh, we mentioned earlier the fairgrounds horses have, have had an advantage here uh, of the 30 run. We've had nine winners from fairgrounds, four from Turfway. And uh, this is a kind of a race where speed is dominant. We talked about uh, in race number, what, two was it earlier today, where this is a split division uh, yeah, this is split division of race number two. So they had the split division means they had a ton of horses enter for it. And they said, hey, we can make two races out of this instead of just having the one. 
and then they'll save another race that was in the condition book for another day. So they split this race. It's a maiden claimer, 20,000 uh, going six furlongs. And again, as we told you in the, in the second race, speed is very important in these races. You want to get a horse on top and just try to wire the thing. I think Lapis Lazuli can do that coming in from fairgrounds on the class drop. So, uh, you know, I, I think that's one to, to lean on. The five fully connected right next door is another who's got early speed, got class on the drop down. Uh, I think the five's a player in here as well. Uh, the nine lunar rocket also has uh, a Brad Cox dropping in class um, and a horse who, you know, with the maiden special to maiden claiming drop probably will show more speed uh, than he has uh, in, in his uh, recent races and actually showed a little bit more speed on the dirt than the last few on the turf. So I think the five, the nine and the eight all on class drops uh, via fairgrounds for the most part, the, the four, the five, the nine and the eight are all basically the same horse on paper. I don't think the eight's as good as some of the other ones, though, so uh, I will drop the eight off my ticket probably reluctantly um, and, and rely on the four, the five, and the nine. And if you're playing a smaller budget and you just want to try to sing one here, I think Lapis Lazuli is the quickest of those inside uh, with the speed and would be the, the most likely wire to wire. But four, five, nine, and if you really want to go deep, maybe the eight to toss in there uh, for the eighth and final race. Well, we hope you enjoyed tonight. Uh, Keeneland Look Ahead, 45 minutes worth. I think it's the season long. So uh, my apologies for being overly loquacious. Uh, we'll try to get through a little bit quicker tomorrow as we take a look at the uh, Thursday card uh, tomorrow night. We'll be back with you to look at a nine race card for Thursday. Again, coming up later this week, we've got some big races. The Double Dog Dare Stakes on Friday featuring Malathot, last year's Kentucky Oaks winner. That's the first big one to look to. And then we've got the Elkhorn on Saturday. Uh, sharing the marquee with the uh, second stakes race on the uh, Saturday card as well, being the Ben Ally stakes. So we've got a lot of great action for you this week at Keeneland. Be sure to check out all the blogs and everything at Keeneland.com, the Clocker Reports, the other expert uh, analysts, uh, people in the selection box. A lot of help for you there at Keeneland. Check out the Clocker Report for the two-year-old races can be valuable as well. And be sure to check in with uh, Scott and Gabby tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. Eastern for Today at Keeneland. They'll preview all the races for you and give you the updated scratches and changes. Should be a great day to start week number three. We thank you for watching.